Let's uh, let's bow our heads one more time for uh, uh, to pray, and then we'll go into the sermon. Lord, I pray that you would guide our thoughts as we look at what it means to be a fully devoted disciple of yours. Uh, talk, speak to our hearts. Help us to recognize ways that we could spend our lives in closer contact with you, learning to become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Hebrew society during the time of Jesus, the, the concept of being a disciple was commonly understood. Everybody, everybody understood the discipleship culture. Anybody could be anyone else's disciple in a way there but there were there were levels of discipleship there were kind of pseudo disciples who were disciples when it was popular and then there were part-time disciples who split split their time between other responsibilities and then there were fully devoted disciples in training particularly for rabbis it, it was a privilege to be the disciple of a rabbi, and not just anybody could be a full-fledged, full-time disciple in training with a rabbi. I remember several years ago, uh, we had a guest speaker at one of our pastor's meetings who described how the discipleship process worked in Jesus's time, and I'd never heard this, and, and uh, where he got his information, I can't even tell you, but it, it was fascinating anyway. Uh, and he, he described how one became a rabbi or a teacher of the law or as a lawyer, as some Bibles translations uh, call them. Uh, they, were, they were experts in the law of Moses. Teachers of the law were those who had memorized, get this, teachers of the law were those who had memorized the five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And if you're familiar with your, your Old Testament and, the, and the, the five books of Moses, that's not a small amount of memorization. That's a lot. So obviously this took a, a lot of training and dedication, but it was nothing compared to the rabbis, at least some of whom had memorized the entire Old Testament. Okay, that, I mean, look at your Bible and and... And look how much of the, 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 that is Old Testament versus New Testament, right? What is that? Two-thirds or three-quarters of the entire Bible memorized by heart. Obviously, that took a great deal of training and education. So they, they would say, anybody could say just a few words in any verse of the Old Testament, and the rabbi could repeat before and after, no problem. In fact, it was said, I, I don't know if it's true or not, but that you could take a pin and stick it through the pages of scripture and the rabbi could tell you which words the pin pierced on the other pages. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but anyway, and, and that would have been before the days when they had lots of different versions and the text laid out all over the place. So anyway, Rabbis had the distinction of not only teaching from the scriptures, but they had the, the ability, the authority to interpret the scriptures. And the rabbis, in particular, had disciples who were rabbis in training. When a Hebrew boy reached five years of age, he began instruction in the Torah. And for the next seven years, he worked on memorizing, largely, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And then came a graduation of sorts when he was 12 years old. Now, so 12 years old was an important date. And you remember how old Jesus was when he impressed the teachers and the rabbis in the temple of his knowledge of scripture, right? He was 12 years old. So when a student reached the age of 12, the rabbi teacher who was instructing the class would talk to each student. And most of them, he would advise that their education was now complete and they should go home and take up their father's business. So go be a godly carpenter or fisherman or whatever, which shed some light on, on 12 year old Jesus's words to his mother. Don't you know that I should be about my father's business, right? The few students who showed promise of actually being able to memorize 
the five books of Moses, the rabbi, he allowed them to continue their studies. And for the next three or four years, they memorized. And at the end of those four years, those who succeeded were eventually able to become a teacher of the law if they wanted to be, because they had that, that, those qualifications. But most of them were also advised, now go home and take up your father's business, good job. It's time for you to go got, be a godly plumber or farmer or whatever. However, there were a few who showed the ability to memorize the entire Old Testament, and they felt the desire to become a rabbi. So at 15 years of age, that young student would go out and he would choose a rabbi whom he wanted to imitate. And he would walk up to the rabbi one day and he would ask him if he could join him for a while just to check him out. And the rabbi would interview the young man, and if he agreed, the student followed the rabbi wherever he went for the next six months, like a, a, like a junior disciple. If the student liked what he saw, if he decided that this was really the kind of person he wanted to pattern his life after, finally he would ask the rabbi if he could become a full-fledged disciple in training of that rabbi. And the rabbi would often advise him, you know, go home and be a godly butcher or baker or something. A rabbi was picky about his disciples because his students were kind of like his resume. This person was going to attach himself to the rabbi in order to become the spitting image of his teacher. And so the rabbi's reputation was on the line through the disciples he accepted. If a rabbi had a particularly bright disciple, that was a serious boost to his reputation. So even to begin training as a rabbi was a difficult thing because the rabbis would not accept just anyone. If you ever wondered why a group of rabbis and teachers surrounded the 12-year-old boy Jesus for three days while his parents searched for him, maybe this gives us a little bit of a hint. They were so impressed with this young man, they actually wanted him to become a disciple of one of them. But Jesus never chose one of them <laughs> to become his rabbi, and pride did not allow the rabbi to go and choose the boy. It didn't work that way. He had to choose someone, and then the rabbi had to decide whether or not to accept him. That's the way it worked. And when the rabbi did accept a young man as a disciple, for the next 15 years, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the disciple would be with the rabbi and everything he did. He would go sometimes and live with the rabbi, or he, the rabbi might even go and live with the disciple. And the disciple would watch how the rabbi, for instance, pronounced a blessing at a wedding, or how he spoke to this person, or how he advised that person. And over the years, the goal was of the disciple was to mimic the rabbi and to become like him in every way. About 15 years later, at the age of 30, the rabbi would do something significant for his disciple. He would give his disciple the authority to become a rabbi himself and to have his own disciples. Now, you remember how old Jesus was when he officially began his ministry and called his disciples? 30 years old. And remember, when the Pharisees demanded of Jesus... In Matthew 21, he said, they said, by what authority are you doing these things? You remember that? Who gave you this authority? This was a significant question. People were calling Jesus a rabbi, and the rabbis knew that Jesus had never been the disciple of another rabbi. They knew no one had given him this authority, which no one but a rabbi could bestow. Matthew 7, 29 even tells us that he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law, 
The teachers of the law, highly respected as they were, they didn't have this authority. And yet, it was obvious that Jesus had this spiritual authority. And where did he get it, they wondered. So here's this man, Jesus, suddenly appears on the scene, and he goes to John the Baptist to be baptized. And John sees Jesus, and he proclaims him to be the Lamb of God. And Andrew and another one of John's part-time employees, they heard, or not employees, disciples, <laughs> heard him say it. Now, remember, Andrew and his companion were men who had been advised at 12 years of age to go be godly fishermen because they couldn't hack the religious training necessary to continue on and eventually become a teacher of the law, much less a rabbi. Yet still they were sincere and deeply spiritual Israelites. And so urged on by John the Baptist's words, they went to Jesus and they asked him, can we check you out? And Jesus said in John 1 39, come, you'll see. Other men also joined them, and they followed Jesus around for a while, and after this trial period, they all went back to fishing. After all, there was no way for men like them to be full-fledged disciples of a rabbi. They knew that. So when Jesus showed up at the Sea of Galilee one day and pointed to Peter and Andrew and others and said, follow me, this wasn't the first time they had seen Jesus. They had already checked him out, but they must have been shocked. Here was this rabbi that they highly respected coming to them, asking them to follow him. That's not the way that it worked. That's not something a rabbi did. And Jesus pointed this out to them. Specifically, later in John 15, he says, you didn't choose me. I chose you. It was the highest honor just to be accepted as the disciple of a rabbi. Imagine the honor of of the rabbi picking you out in particular and asking you to follow him instead of the other way around. That was a significant moment for the disciples, an almost unprecedented honor. And so they dropped everything and followed him. They had seen Jesus at work. They were ready to make that 24-7 commitment to Jesus with the goal of becoming just like him. And then, if you'll remember, near the end of Jesus' ministry, Jesus gave his disciples authority, Matthew 10.1. He called his 12 to him, and he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Another significant moment. For most disciples, this didn't happen until 15 years of training. But these men who had been advised to go back to the family business, they received authority from God himself, and they were told to go and do what only rabbis could do after years and years of training. They were to make disciples. And it's still the same for Jesus's followers today. In order to make disciples, we must be disciples with the authority from God to do so. So what does being a disciple look like today? In Matthew 28, when Jesus was about to ascend to heaven, he said to his disciples surrounding him, you remember this? All what was given to me? All authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. Therefore, what? Go Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, right? Jesus' instructions to all of his disciples, because that wasn't just for them, it's for us too. Jesus' instruction for all of his disciples is to go and make disciples, baptizing them, and then teaching them to obey. So, that, and the order is interesting here. It's important. The beginning of discipleship is baptism. A baptized person at that point is taking his first steps in discipleship. So our job of becoming a disciple is not complete when we're baptized. It's only beginning. So we should, likewise, understand that our job of making a disciple is not complete when that person's baptized. It's only the beginning. Remember the story when Jesus was told that his mother and brothers had come to see him and, and Jesus' reply? He said, who are my mother and brothers? 
And then he motioned to his disciples around him, all the people there. And he said, here are my brother and brothers. Now, Jesus, he wasn't being rude to his family. He was redefining his family. He was saying, you're not part of my family just because we're related by blood. You're not part of my family because you belong to a certain people. You're not part of my family just because you belong to a certain church. None of those things make you a part of my family. What makes you a part of my family is if you are my disciple. If you follow me, if you obey my commands, if you spend your, your life walking with me, trying to become just like me. And it's obvious that being a disciple and making disciples is of utmost importance to God. But what does that mean? What, is it, what does a true disciple look like? And our first reaction might be sometimes, like some of the Pharisees, to think of a true disciple as someone who's finally reached a certain level, someone who's finally reached a, at least a, 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 a semblance of perfection, a person who has modified his behavior to the point that he's reached some ethereal arrival point. Disciples of Jesus, of course, do in, exhibit good behavior, but <laughs> good behavior doesn't necessarily prove that somebody's a disciple. After all, the Pharisees were on their best behavior, and they definitely were not disciples. And Jesus' disciples made their share of bad choices. So good behavior alone doesn't prove that one is or is not a true disciple. And that's because discipleship's not primarily concerned with behavior modification. Should I say that again? Behavior is not primarily concerned with behavior modification. So discipleship is not about coming to prayer meeting. It's not about being baptized. It's not about becoming a vegetarian. It's not about rejecting alcohol, tobacco, coffee, sugar, whatever it might be. Discipleship's not any of those things. Discipleship is one thing and one thing only, and that is being with Jesus 24 hours a day, seven days a week in order to become like him. That's what being a disciple is all about. Now, naturally, in that kind of environment, behavior is going to be modified. There's no question about it. When you live with Jesus, your behavior will change, but the journey isn't toward perfect behavior. The journey is toward Jesus Christ. Different behavior is only a side effect of spending time with Jesus. Jesus' 12 disciples, if you will recall, had serious behavior problems. <laughs> Even after his death, after spending three and a half years walking and talking directly with Christ himself, they still had behavioral problems, but they were called disciples from the very beginning, even while their behavior was not up to par. Why? Because when Jesus said, follow me, they did it. Unhesitatingly, without reserve, they committed themselves to being around Jesus all the time. And that's a disciple, someone who is constantly following closely to Jesus. I like the way someone named Damian Johnson, I don't even know who that is, but I like the way he put it. We don't have a behavioral problem. We have a proximity problem. We're not around Jesus enough. Yeah, we meet him from time to time at church or devotions or at an Easter or a Christmas program or during prayer meeting, but that's, that's not enough to be a full-time, fully devoted disciple. So today, I want to just quickly run through seven identifying marks of a disciple. And, and I want you to note, especially number one, because it's the most important, and the fact is, is that all the rest of the list will come naturally if you do only number one, okay? Throughout his or her life, a fully devoted disciple spends increasingly more time with Jesus. Okay? A fully devoted disciple spends increasingly more time with Jesus. There is no way to learn to imitate Jesus unless you spend more and more time with him. Now, of course, it starts making with making time every day to read your Bible and pray, 
making that a habit and a top priority is ground zero for a disciple. If you don't do that, you're not going to go anywhere. So it begins there. And you can be absolutely 100% positive that the devil is going to throw any kind of wrench into the gears of your schedule to make sure it doesn't happen. So if you want to be a fully devoted disciple of Jesus, you have to make that time every day. Even if you have to, even if you stayed up too late, even if you have a plane to catch, even if it means you miss breakfast, daily devotional time set aside for Jesus, ground zero, non-negotiable for a disciple. But spending increasingly more time with Jesus every day means more than just that precious hour in the morning. It means learning how to spend your entire day with Jesus. A, a serious disciple involves Jesus in every moment of every day. A, a disciple seeks direction from him from moment to moment. In his or her relaxing time, a disciple chooses to do things that draws him closer to God. Throughout his life, a disciple of Christ spends every day increasingly more and more time with Jesus until he eventually learns how to spend all day, every day with God. He learns how to walk with God like Enoch did. He goes about his activities, but he does it constantly in the company of Jesus. Okay, that's number one. And everything else from here on, if you do that, everything else comes, all right? Number two, a disciple of Jesus consistently improves in imitating Jesus. Jesus is always patient and kind. That means that's what a disciple is going to be striving to be. Jesus always tries to build people up rather than tearing him down. So does a disciple. Jesus is unaffected when a rude driver cuts him off. Did you know that? Unaffected when a rude driver cuts him off. <laughs> a fully devoted disciple of Jesus aspires to the same kind of patience. Jesus willingly surrendered his personal rights for the good of other people. Wow. His disciples do that too. A disciple consistently grows in learning to imitate Jesus, not only on the outside where everybody can see, but on the inside where it's genuine. Number three, a disciple is radically devoted to Jesus. That means for a disciple, there's nothing and no one more important than Jesus. A disciple is devoted enough to Jesus to give up even the things most precious to him in exchange for Jesus if that's necessary. A disciple, is, a disciple is willing to accept the hardship that comes with following Jesus. A disciple, like Jesus, devotes his life to helping other people. And like Jesus, a disciple is willing to stand alone in obedience to God against the whole world if necessary. So the, a disciple's devotion to Jesus is radical. People think it's extreme, and there's a reason. Okay? Number four. A disciple deeply loves everybody, not just select people, everybody, no matter how they happen to feel about him. Jesus loved even those who hated him and despitefully used him, which means that his disciples will strive to do the same. Number five, a disciple actually does what Jesus says to do. <laughs> Imagine that. When Jesus says to let yourself be wronged rather than fight, he's talking to his disciples. When Jesus says, turn the other cheek. When Jesus says, if you're forced to carry someone's load for a mile, carry it too. He's talking to his disciples. If Jesus says, keep the Sabbath holy or return a faithful tithe, he's talking to his disciples. And when people accuse a disciple of being a legalist for actually doing what Jesus says to do, which they do, a fully devoted disciple of Jesus obeys anyway. A true disciple actually does what Jesus says to do, no matter how crazy it sounds. Number six, a disciple takes personal responsibility for proclaiming the gospel. A, dis a disciple never thinks that sharing the good news of the gospel is the pastor's job or an elder's job. A disciple feels a personal responsibility to the people around him or her. And if a disciple is not able to directly talk to them of spiritual things, he's praying for the opportunity to do so. Always. And finally, disciples produce more disciples. 
And th now this is different from producing church members. It's even different from baptizing someone. Producing more disciples means that you are actively helping someone else who perhaps has already been baptized to become a true disciple. It means that you're helping someone to learn how to spend all day, every day in the presence of Jesus. Every disciple is called to disciple someone else, to help them, to encourage them to develop a closer relationship with Jesus. A true disciple produces more disciples. It's important that we know what a disciple looks like because too often we miss the critical elements of what it means. Some people think that they can be disciples without spending more and more time with Jesus, without striving to act like Jesus, without doing what Jesus said to do. But a person is not a fully devoted disciple without that radical commitment. Imagine in your mind that Jesus has come to your place of work like he did when he went to the shore of Galilee to call Peter, James, and John. Or imagine that he's knocking on your front door. And when you open, he says, follow me. And you know that if you accept his invitation, that it means you're promising to be with him 24-7 and that your time with him has only one purpose, and that is to become just like him. He is there, standing there saying, follow me. So don't take the call lightly. You might remember that there were a number of people that came up to Jesus and said, I'll follow you. And Jesus told them, hold up. Think about what you're saying. Think about what you're promising. And these stories are recorded because Jesus still wants us today to think about what we're promising when we agree to follow him. It is an unprecedented honor, like it was for the 12 disciples, to have the rabbi choose us to be his disciples. So let me add my invitation to you today to accept his invitation. Spend your days with Jesus, and you will become more like him. Amen.